Hey, hello! You're about to enjoy Rich Shag's Lesser Square Theatre podcast. If you do like this show, it is free. You can pay us back in lots of different ways. One is to come and see me on tour. My show, Lord of the Dance Seti, is on tour right through January through to May 2015. I am coming to Northampton, Colchester, Ellsbury, Exeter, Cheddar. That's the big one. That's what everyone wants to see. Uh, Nottingham, Wolverhampton, Salford, Chorley, Brighton, Crawley. Made at Canterbury, Reading. That one always sells out. It's a tiny little venue. Book ahead. Didcot, that sells well as well. That's going to be a great two days in the middle of March. Winchester, Bristol, Newcastle, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Chesterfield, Norwich, Birmingham, Southend. Aldershot, that always sells out as well. Cambridge, Shoreham by Sea. Really? Fucking hell. I could go anywhere, wouldn't I? Uh, Cardiff, Bath, Andover, New Greenham Arts. A Worthing Forest Arts. I like any art centre I'll go to. Portsmouth, Harlow, Bristol again, Monmouth, Shrewsbury, Stockton on Tees, Leeds, Peterborough, London, London, Taunton, Swindon, Borden. That's not even a place. That's in uh, Lord of the Rings. And Red Hill. Uh, go to richtowning.com slash gigs. You can see details of all of those. If you enough of you come to see that, I can then afford to do these things for free. Or you can go to gofasterstrike.com slash badges and make a little donation to keep us going. Anyway, enough of that. Let's enjoy this week's guest on Richard Herring's Letter Square Theatre podcast. And welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who is the pick and mix Robin Hood. It is Richard Herring. Oh yeah. Lovely to see you. Thanks for coming. You're much better than last week's audience. So, uh, oh no. Uh, so welcome to Richard Herring's. Leicester Square Theatre Podcast, or as some really cool people just to start calling it, Rahel Burke. Yes, uh, it's uh, been a fun uh, week. Oh, let's see what I've been up to this week in my Slytherin notebook. My aunt. <laughs> this is my auntie J.K. Rowling Slytherin notebook. She hates it. I bought this. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there's been all sorts of stuff uh, going on. We've got a fantastic guest, Andy Zoltzman, uh, coming up. Uh, so, D- David Cameron, well, this is not for you people at home, this is going out quite late. David Cameron has been hit by a jogger today, <laughs> which, uh, you know, in a week where the Canadian Parliament has been attacked by a man with a machine gun, that's pretty lax. <laughs> I wouldn't know. The thing is, David, he was running, so we couldn't. How, would, how could we stop him getting to you? There was no way. <laughs> So good to know. It's a shame he just bumped into him, but that is a that is a warning. Uh, I, uh, but I, I'm I'm kind of fascinated by. Uh, uh, we might talk to our guests about this, but I'm sort of I I keep coming up with great terrorist atrocities myself, and then I feel it's my duty to tell the world what they are, so that that will stop terrorists doing them, as long as like the security services listen to this podcast, because I know that Al Qaeda and ISIS uh, do listen to this podcast for ideas. I've got a good idea for you. Don't do this, but if you're going to do one anyway, if you're going to do it anyway, do this, because you know you're not allowed to take liquids on planes, because they can make explosives out of those. What I thought when I was getting on the plane the other day is why don't they make the explosives into Barocca tablets and put them, put them in a tube of Barocca, and then they can add, just add water on them. Can't they? It's a fucking good idea. I've got to tell you, that's, I'd be a brilliant terrorist. I mean, I, you know, the thing is, I don't really want to kill loads of people, but I, I like the I like the invention that comes along <laughs> with uh, with that. And talking to terrorist atrocities, I was in Brighton um, this week doing a gig, and uh, I was sharing a theatre seriously with Margaret Thatcher, which was a surprise. The dressing room next to mine, Margaret Thatcher was in. Like, she's doing like a cabaret act for sort of slightly camp cabaret act now with dancing men and stuff uh, in it. And at the end of the at the end of the, uh, my show, I said, you know, I can only do an hour-long show because m- I'm sharing the theatre with Margaret Thatcher, which is unexpected. In Brighton, that's unexpected, you know. Uh, I only have to be lucky once. Uh, uh, which is... <laughs> which was my favourite thing. I mean, again, I'm against terrorists. I don't want you going away from this thinking Rich Herring is trying to help terrorists and likes terrorists. I don't. I think terrorism is wrong. But that's what the IRA... <laughs> 
when they tried to blow up Margaret Thatcher and they didn't blow her up, they got Norman. Do you remember old Norman Tebbit? Uh, he's all right and he's still all right. Uh, so he's still having to go at the poor. Uh, even now. Uh, they, the IRA said, you know, you were lucky this time, we only have to be lucky once. Which I think is the coolest thing a terrorist has ever said. I mean, that's really... And they weren't, and then I did make the point in the show, you know, Margaret Thatcher happily lived into her old age and happily got Alzheimer's disease and didn't get killed by the IRA, didn't she? So, one nil to Margaret Thatcher. That is, uh, they couldn't even kill an old woman with Alzheimer's disease. That's how, that's how rubbish the IRA are. So it's an, it's an anti-terrorism message there. You can relax. You're confused, aren't you? Because so what's he... I don't really like Margaret Thatcher, but I'm not sure I like the IRA either. I don't know who is the victim of this. Is he pro Margaret Thatcher? Or is that? It's difficult to know. Uh, and I, when I was on the train uh, to uh, Brighton, um, uh, there was a man, you know, like the, and this happens a lot on public transport, but usually it's kids. There was a guy with his mobile phone playing his music without headphones, just playing it, and he was like a grown man. Uh, and everyone was looking at each other going, and it was, you know, it was quite a tough looking guy who's obviously trying to intimidate people. I just thought it was pathetic. So I turned around to him and said, can you put your headphones on, please? I thought I'd be the guy. I thought I'd give it a go. Uh, and I was obviously worried about being pummeled in the face, because that's, that's really why he was doing it, right? So that's your suspicion, is they want an excuse to hit you. But he kind of went, oh, no, well, sorry, someone stole my headphones. Uh, so I went, and I you know, wanted to say, well, that's not really my problem, is it? That's your... <laughs> doesn't mean you can start playing. You've got to buy some new headphones and then you can... And they said, can I borrow your headphones? <laughs> and I said, no, that's not how... Why don't I going to give you my headphones? And then you've got your stranger earwax in them. I'm not into that. Uh, and then he was playing. He said, luckily, it's a good song, so it's good. But I, di I didn't agree with him. I didn't... I mean, I like the smell of my own farts, but I'm not... That doesn't mean I'm going to fart in a train carriage. That's not entirely true. I, um... <laughs> I don't always like the smell of my... The ones I'm doing this week are disgusting. I don't... I mean, I only like them on the, on the level that they're so bad that it's kind of hard to believe that's come out of a human body. At the moment, you might smell one later, you're in the front row. That's touch and go. Also, I do sometimes fart on the train, so that it's not, it wasn't a good analogy. Usually by accident. Sometimes just, you know, people have got my nerves. They can think, you know, this will teach them. And, that, and unlike the music playing, though, the good thing about farting on a train is it's... Because the music, you know, you know, it's just an annoyance. But with a fart, it's like a little whodunit mystery for the other passengers, isn't it? So that's, I see that as a little gift. Looking around, because when I know, I try to work out who it was when it is when I know it, it, if it's me, I know it was me usually. <laughs> but uh, often I don't. Anyway, we uh, it's time to welcome uh, this week's guest. Uh, you'll be very excited to see me as uh, my second favourite comedian, whose name is Andy Something Man. <laughs> The other one, the best, the, my favourite is Andy Kaufman, which is, he's one of the best comedians in the world, so that's not bad, but if your name's Andy something, man, you've got to be, feel bad that you're not the favourite <laughs> comedian <laughs> with that name. Uh, and he's best remembered, of course, you will know him from his appearance on episode five of Never Mind the Full Stops, not Never Mind the Buscocks, <laughs> Never Mind the Full Stops, the uh, grammar-based <laughs> quiz show. <laughs> Uh, hosted by Julian Fellows, who went on to write Downton Abbey. You're, you're all like reacting like you don't know what that is. That's, that's the... Because that is what he is best known for. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Andy Zolzman. Bring, bring him up. Andy Zolzman. How are you? Hello. Welcome. Pick up a microphone. That will make it easier. We've both gone for quite loud shirts this week. I was, yeah. I was worried that mine might strobe. Then I saw what... Then I saw what you were wearing, I thought, oh, well. Right. <laughs> well, I'd heard you were going to go with just a, just a simple kind of blue and white stripe. I yeah. thought, I can trump that. <laughs> I had my spies in your wardrobe. <laughs> Which is good to know. Do you remember, do you remember much about the... Well, get out of the way, because you get asked this all the time. Yeah. Do you remember much about your appearance on Never Mind the Full Stop? Not Never what? Mind the Buzzcocks, Never Mind the Full Stops. <laughs> well, That's the clever thing about it. I remember thinking that there was no way that a a panel show about grammar and punctuation <laughs> was not going to be the biggest TV <laughs> hit in the history of human creativity. What I remember most really is just for about a year, year and a half afterwards, I could barely leave the house without <laughs> just like loads of paparazzi giving me shit. So, it's, I mean, it's, you've brought up some pretty harrowing memories, to be honest. <laughs> 
Do, did you find... Is this Julian Fellows? That's his name, isn't it? Yeah. Do we, we, he, did you find him an unbearable prig? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, see, I, 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 I don't know. I only spent about, well, 40 minutes. Was that not the, enough? I don't know. I, it did leave me with the sus suspicion that he might have that club in his bag. <laughs> He's, uh, I, I, I did that show as well. I, yeah. At the end, I just, uh, when we were doing retakes, I just, you know, because it's like being told off by a teacher and you go, oh, God, you know, it's quite hard anyway. And I didn't think I know about punctuation. Yeah. And then we were doing one of the retakes and, you, and he said something and I just went, oh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone really right. laughed in the audience, making me suspect that they didn't like him either. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's why you've never been cast in Downton Abbey. <laughs> <It> <laughs> Uh, would, you, would you think we, you and I would be above stairs or below stairs <laughs> down that bit, or in the, buried in oh. the stairs? Yeah, under the, yeah, the, the literal skeletons <laughs> in the cover. <laughs> I went to the Tower of London uh, this week, funnily enough. I saw the spot where the uh, Richard and Edward, is, it, uh, is, that, is that right? Mm. Have I got that right, nerds? Richard and Ed, Edward V and, Ri and Richard, some prince. The, yeah. <laughs> where they were buried. Right. Probably them. Right, n not yeah. where they were holed up in a... <laughs> In a, in a wall or whatever. They were, they were, they were under some stairs, yes. Right. Little, they show you where it was, where, these right. bo where the bodies were found. They found two little boy skeletons in a box. Right. Is it still, like, cordoned off <laughs> with, police, <laughs> with police tape? With chalk. I mean, it's still, a, it's still an open, open crime, isn't yeah. it, on the police books? I mean, who yeah. did it? Did any of you do it? Did any... <laughs> um, anyway. It's, it's never too late to solve a crime, even. I reckon <laughs> it was... That was, uh, was, was an old Muddy Waters song, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's have a look at what's been going on. I looked up... You, uh, let's get this out of the way. I, every week I look at Dirty Brick Confession, Brick Com Confessions right. where people, uh, comedy fans, give their sexual fantasies about various comedians. Have you seen right. this website? No, I haven't. No. And I'm very pleased that I've... Uh, I, was, I kind of went in with some trepidation with you because I imagined... The that you wouldn't find I'd anything there? <laughs> <laughs> there weren't any, which I was glad well, about. But, good, yeah. uh, which is... Quite, uh, you know, it's, I don't know if that's insulting or whether the people respect you so much they can't right. think of you in a sexual way. Um, <laughs> I don't know, man. That's what my wife says. So, uh. <laughs> Though I did tweet about it, and people suggested they might, you know, they suggested it will start with "I would like to get a cricket bat" and so and so. Right. Uh, but your sister yep. uh, tweeted and was quite pleased there wasn't anything. Oh, well, that's. <laughs> that, that is, I'm, I'm very. I'm yeah. pleased. I've, I believe my career has now been worthwhile. <laughs> avoided appearing on that. Yeah. That. But if anyone wants to put one on there for Andy, it's quite rude that he's not on there. Yeah. But you are, you are the second Zoltzman to appear on uh, Change Less Square Theatre podcast, as your sister, yep. Helen. Appeared. Do you think any of the rest of your family we could get on? Is, would your um, would you grant well, be any good on here? If you if you if you uh, raise the fee for it, then I reckon they're all <laughs> they're, they'll all be interested. Yeah. Um, you could try my dad. Yeah. He's a, he's a sculptor. Yeah, he's, he's a sculptor. A, he's a, he's a very funny man. He um, when my sister got married, I don't know if she talked about this on your <laughs> podcast. Uh, he gave a, 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 a incredible father of the bride speech. Now traditionally, the father of the bride speech. He's quite moving, quite serious, you know, touching expression of what the daughter means to the father. <laughs> My father went with ten minutes of puns, which... <laughs> are, um, and I think it was probably the highlight of his life, <laughs> you know, judging by the look on his face. And I'm sure he was wearing this, this quite plump bow tie, and I'm sure it grew during the course of his speech. <laughs> Were there puns about your sister, or were they just his favourite puns? There were some in which he managed to crowbar a mention <laughs> of my sister in, but... Uh, yeah. I once saw someone do a Far of the bride, bride speech where he literally just printed some jokes off the internet right. that weren't connected, <laughs> really even to marriage. I mean, they were very... <laughs> they were certainly connected to his daughter. And, you know, so he would go, well, parsimony, that's something you need if you're married. <laughs> and then there would be a, you know, a bon, mo a bon mo from... And it wasn't about That's how I write an Edinburgh show. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> but that's all right for an Edinburgh show, because that's not all that important. But the father of the bride <laughs> speech, you're hoping for some moment of, yeah. I quite like my... You know, in the end of the day, I quite like my daughter. I'm glad she's married. Even that at the end of some jokes printed off the internet would be... Yeah. It's just hard to get a setup that fits in with that particular punchline. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> um, so I, I, I'm quite interested in art. Is the, is the artistic... Uh, gene passed down to you? Uh, so no, it's entirely sidestepped me. It? Um, <laughs> like a Fijian rugby player. It's, um, 
uh, I have, I would say, negative artistic skill. Yeah. Whereas my sister's quite a, a gifted artist. Right. Um, I am currently, I think, marginally worse than my two children, who are <laughs> aged seven and five. I think they've already overtaken me. Right. So, yeah, I'm a dis just disastrous with a pencil. If you have, but do you? Because I, I can keep on coming up with conceptual art that I think could win the Turner Prize. Like which like, is like what? Well, I, I have talked about it, but there's the thing where I realised um, if I'd if I'd kept all the pairs of shoes I'd ever had in my life from uh, for a baby till I died. Right. And then just place them in a row. You'd look like a closet Nazi? I don't know. <laughs> no, be, that would be an amazing... <laughs> Not for the first time, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be my own shoes. Oh, right, okay, that's fine. I haven't fine, killed then. anyone to, right. to get this Apart display. Apart from yourself. <laughs> well, eventually I'd be dead. Yeah. I wouldn't display it until I was dead, and it'd be every right. pair of shoes, and it would show, A, the, the absence of yourself from those shoes, as you s has, is quite evocative. Oh, it's haunting. As you've, haunting. As you've spotted straight yeah. away. But also the, the way those tiny booties grow into children's shoes, into adult shoes. Then I, I think the way also your shoes, as you get older, would be uh, more similar and probably... Some shoes would be, you know, you use a lot and they're worn out and some you hardly ever wore. Yeah. And then I think your taste towards the end of your life would become more and more similar. <coughs> so right. I think it would tell a lot about the human condition to do that. And if, it, if you had a lot of them, you could call it walk a mile in my shoes. It could be like a mile long. You've thought about this far yeah. too hard. <laughs> I want to win the Turner right. Prize. So well, I think I'd do anything. something similar, but w only with pogo sticks. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know. How many pogo sticks have you had in your life? Uh, I've used one. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I think, but starting that work of art would encourage me to bounce more than I had previously. <laughs> <laughs> and that has to be good at you know. Well, that could be a companion piece: Richard yeah. Herring's shoes and Andy Osman's one, one, <laughs> one poke. But, but it would, in many ways, it would be uh, an expression both of hope, yeah. but also of failure. Yeah. And, you know, what greater work of art could there possibly be? And if you died falling off a pogo stick, yeah. you could have bought a pogo stick as an adult. Now, you probably would kill yourself if you had a. Yes. go on it really realistically well that's possible I mean maybe you could incorporate the pogo stick into one of your <laughs> hypothetical terrorist atrocities I don't know has a, has a pogo I mean a pogo stick is generally viewed as a symbol of peace yeah but, <laughs> but maybe uh, well it has that spring element eh? you could yeah. use you could use it to the element of surprise to jump over something to get like the David Cameron man could have jumped over the security guards and they would if they can't even cope with someone running yeah. imagine if that person is running and then bouncing they're going to and then well, you bang, is, yeah. or you could you you know you could bounce underneath the plane as it's taking off, stick a bomb <laughs> on the bottom of it, <laughs> bounce away. So the pogo it's stick might be a very good. T and people would see you on a pogo stick, and they think and he poses no threat. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because I do, the, I do a bit ultimate. about a sombrero in my current show. Right. If someone's wearing a sombrero, you kind of think, oh, they're they're good fun and a laugh. Right. But I basically saw a mentally ill man wearing a sombrero who turned quite crazy and threatening but you know so you are and right. even when he was doing it you're still laughing because of the sombrero right. because of the sombrero it means so if, if someone there. runs at Dave Cameron wearing a sombrero he's going to go oh, <laughs> the Bullingdon club started up again here we go <laughs> it's all going to be fun really? that's ho horrible to think of the sombrero sullied <laughs> yeah exactly sullied do you that. spend a lot of time thinking up terrorist atrocities well I haven't to date no. but having listened to because I, bit on it, I, think I, I came might. up with uh, one they used basically. I came, I saw a woman quite. I saw a woman, right, wearing. At what point did you do that? I saw a woman. No, it's right. not. It's not. That's not. It's the Trojan woman. <laughs> right. Nearly, well, it nearly is. I saw a woman at an airport with who was quite well endowed, breastwise. Right. And then I thought you could just, you know. I'm glad like, you clarified that well endowed. <laughs> <I wonder what? laughs> she didn't have a massive. She didn't have a lot of <laughs> a lot of financial endowments. I don't know. <laughs> and I thought, you know, there's enough. You know, if you're not allowed to take 100 millilitres onto the plane, there's enough within a, a good-sized breast. Right. Uh, of if, you, if you were to put... You're saying Bin Laden was a tit man more than a leg man. <laughs> right. is that what I'm saying if he had been, he could have brought down more right. plane. Because you could put in... <laughs> you could put in... Which they apparently are doing. You can put in, like, a little pack in there, couldn't you? And then... <laughs> yeah. So right. And the pants. Oh, and yeah. the pants bomb. <laughs> I've, you know, I've, I've, thought of quite, I've thought of quite a few. Yes. That's but yeah. I see that as my... There must be people whose job it is to sit and w think about what possible terrorist atrocities they could be. Yeah, they mostly work for American TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, I think you should think more about that. Uh, that, was, that was a line 24 never took in eight series, was it? The, <laughs> the giant explosive tits. No. 
but you could have put inside. Jack Brown in a difficult spot. I think you can. You, you know, no, no one's going to like. You can't. F- you know, you feeling no, it's, around. No, aren't it's you? not politically you can't correct. Go, is it? Well, let me just feel yeah. that to see. Thank you, Brussels. <laughs> to see if what I, I think, and even then, it would see, even a false breast feels like it probably feels it's the same stuff. Probably, I don't know. I haven't gone around. I haven't taken it that far that I've done this right. an experiment in the laboratory to discover that fact yet. Right. Well, that's why you're not a terrorist. <laughs> you haven't made that crucial last step. But it's, I, I think, would you have been... It's the kind of same thing, I suppose, in World War Two about the great escape and the people trying to escape from places. Yeah. That they, you know, there's people sitting there trying to think of... Well, yeah, that's mostly get... gymnastics based in those. <laughs> it's, well, a pogo stick but would be very useful in that. Yeah, pogo that stick. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I think the German, the Nazi guards probably saw through the pogo stick. Well, it didn't <laughs> start? It, it was a military thing, wasn't it? The, the pogo si- stick. The siege of Mafeking was. But <laughs> <laughs> well, people disguised as um, little impalas bouncing around the landscape. I believe. <laughs> I'm a I, bit out of the loop. I think you would have been good in Colditz. Oh, right. I don't want you to be put in Colditz. <laughs> I think you would have. But that, you're that kind of guy who would sit there coming up with ideas to have how to escape. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a natural coward, though, as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good, but you could be the ideas guy. I right. mean, even if you didn't have any, just the way you look, I think if you had that guy... I could have been the, de- the decoy <laughs> ideas guy. So everyone would have thought I was the ideas yeah. guy. Was, in fact, I was just sitting in the corner whimpering and asking to see my mother. But, you know, that's, that's a, that's a good, good cover. Good. Well, I'll, I'll bear that in mind. If, if, if you only you'd have been around to suggest that in Colditz. Yeah. I think you'd have been great in Colditz as well, suggesting who could be the ideas guy. <laughs> But then you're getting too much, you're getting too many levels of admin in. That can really destroy an escape plan. <laughs> Just leave a trail of paperwork behind. <laughs> so you do the Bugle podcast yes. with uh, John Oliver. Um, what's it like um, with working in a double act where the other one goes on to be a lot more successful? <laughs> Absolutely no idea. Really. <laughs> <laughs> At least you, he's, he still works with the. He's nice and that he still does the podcast with you. Yes. That's what a nice double act partner would do. Yeah. <laughs> Although he did put a literal ocean between us. Because so. <laughs> <laughs> we worked together, um, we, did, when we, we did a gig back in about 2000, it must be 2004, maybe 2000, yeah, 2004, I think it was, 2003. We're at Aldershot, which yes. sticks in the mind, where you and John were previewing your Edinburgh show and I was previewing my Edinburgh show. Yep. It didn't go. No, I think we both took fairly heavy enemy fire on that. <laughs> well, almost literally. Yes. There was, it was older shot and there was some squaddies in who were expecting a night of, you know... Comedy. Some jokes. <laughs> that is most assuredly what they did not get. <laughs> and you, you and John were in the quite early stages of your show. Yes. Your political satire show. Yes. Uh, and did an hour. Uh, yes. Uh, and they were still booing you when I came on. <laughs> oh, after a 20 minute interval, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I came on and, and did a show about her, m- me doing, well, about Greek gods and Hercules. And yeah. uh, as I began, the two minutes in, you know, within 30 seconds, someone went, oh God, not another one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we were very much the John the Baptist to your <laughs> Jesus of failure, I yeah, think. And in fact, I, th- I said to these guys, you're not going to enjoy my set. I will give you your money back if you will leave now because you're really not going to enjoy it. He went, no, don't you judge me. I might enjoy it. Don't you, don't you judge me. I'm gonna... And then two minutes later, he left. And I said, see, you, know, you could have had your money back if you left <laughs> 120 seconds ago, but you know, I'm not giving you money now. And then he came to the stage and stood to me nose to nose uh, and was sort of shouting at me. Yeah. But I had the kind of false confidence of being on stage. Uh, this was genuinely like a squaddy who might have been in the SAS <laughs> in old shot who could have killed me with his just yeah. But I sort of fronted him out. Right. I mean, he would have got in trouble for that. I think. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, we, we were that I mean, bad. Not <laughs> yeah. I guess. I mean, it's very hard legally to define when a failed gig becomes a hostage situation. <laughs> Punishable by death. Yeah. I think I reckon if a guy who was if he was in the SAS and some secret services yeah. and he killed a comedian. We've all done it. I think <laughs> I think they would have hushed it up. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, they would have got away with it. It's basically yeah. what happened in episode uh, one or two of Homeland uh, series. Well they bumped off a stand up. Well it? no, a guy a guy got annoyed with some blokes in a bar. 
uh, taking the piss out of his plump girlfriend. Right. And went and, and then took out a hit on Russ Abbott. <laughs> 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 he, he, he beat them up, but then basically just, you know, he's high up enough that have let him up, let right. him go. Mind you, I don't know if Homeland is a true story. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Could happen. That is the terrifying thing. So, uh, so yeah, so what, what is it? Like, how, how do you, are you happy for John Oliver's success or do you wish that was you uh, in The uh, Love Guru? Well, I mean, obviously, <laughs> The Love Guru was very much his, his uh, artistic high point. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, it was a film, uh, it was a Mike Myers film that... Um, and that no one has heard of. <laughs> yeah, that no, makes I, really I best. Believe it didn't smash too many box office <laughs> records. <laughs> Apart from maybe most people demanding a refund. I don't know if I You know what Mike Myers should have done with that? Should have put a Shrek in it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> because Mike Myers plays Shrek, <laughs> that was a brilliant joke. It's the only one of the series, that's the only one you get. I had the opportunity <laughs> with Steve Coogan when they had uh, Jackie Chan. I thought people were going, he's going to go. They put Jackie Chan in Around the World in 80 Days. I should have said, you know what they should have done, Steve? They should have put a Shrek in it. That's why I, sh I didn't do it. Because well. I had too much respect for the audience. <laughs> and apparently don't even know. There's a lot of newer people who don't know the old catchphrases. <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if, you could if you could swap places with John Oliver, would you swap, would you swap lives with him in a kind uh, of vice versa well, way? Well, uh, I mean, that would be awkward on a personal level. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure how good he is with children. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And he's got, a, he's got a dog. Yeah, uh, you don't like dogs? Well, I quite like dogs, but I can't really be asked to take them for a walk every day. So yeah. I think we'd probably both get in trouble on that front. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, no, I think if I swapped places with John Oliver, then uh, his show would be cancelled pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you that. So, um, I'll give you that. We'll move. He doesn't like talking about John Oliver. Let's, let's move. I can sense it. It's, it's another Stephen Merchant moment coming up. So, um, <laughs> you like sport? I do like sport. That's weird. Why what's is that, that weird, about, Richard? What's that about? Why would you like sport? Well, it's, it's better than reality. Okay. <laughs> reality is just a constant series of letdowns. <laughs> Whereas sport at least offers a hope of a brighter world. Not, not if you support York City, it doesn't. That no, is, no, that, that is. is <laughs> but that is that sport. Again, we're in the awkward semantics, aren't we? Yeah. When is, w at what point does lower league football just become <laughs> legalised violence? I mean, it's, <laughs> when the courts have never adequately ruled on that, I don't believe. And what is it about cricket that you enjoy so much? Well, cricket, I particularly enjoy the fact that, you know, with a test match you get essentially carte blanche to clock off from real life family, work and news for five entire days. <laughs> or if India are playing two and a half entire days. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's that, it's that, that, uh, that escape into a, you know, the sinuous narratives of, a, of, a, of, a, of an unfolding sporting <laughs> drama. But it's, well, that's better than seeing the latest speech by Ed Miliband, isn't it, surely? So even people who hate cricket would rather watch Alistair Cook scoring ten in four hours than I don't think that's listen to Ed Miliband read an erotic novel. I think <laughs> I'm not sure Ed Miliband is the benchmark by which everything should be judged. Because <laughs> in that case, nearly everything is better than yeah. child murder is preferable to that. So <laughs> my audience are very easily shockable this week. I better I better pull back a little bit on the. Uh, <laughs> I like, but you do commentary. And th I mean, I like that's the side of sport I like is the statistics yes. and commentary. I love commentating on things. Yes, um, I'm, I, mean, I think comedy and sport kind of there's a, there's a mi there's not been enough comedy and sport m mic crossover. I think no, people I take sport no. very seriously. Well, it's, I mean, they are two sides of the bullshit coin, aren't they? Yeah. So I mean, they should dance in bullshit harmony. <laughs> <laughs> Because I like um, commentate. I commentate on uh, annoying. I think QPR have got onto this. What I do because they've they you most football matches are on Saturday, sometimes Sunday. QPR yeah. this week are playing on a Monday night at the same time as this podcast because right. they know what I like to do. I live near Loftus Road and I like to commentate via Twitter on the QPR matches based uh, on the noise, based on the sound, oh, right. and and work out what the score is and work out what's just happened. Right. And then that is the score, whatever is the real right. score. <laughs> and I think all games should be played like that, or certainly all commentary should be done like that. Yes. I mean, it would make, I mean, it would make the Robbie Savage a much more interesting man. <laughs> I think if, 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 
the tree was done. Have you tried it with other sports, though, like chess? <laughs> I have <laughs> based yeah. on the crowd noise. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I could give it a go. I don't know that much about chess, but I could... I don't know that much about football, to be honest, but no. I do know the sounds that people make when... I can tell, you can distinguish an ironic cheer from a real cheer quite easily. Yes. So you know the difference between a goal and someone really fucking up quite badly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I mean, that's, that that's goes back to our primeval roots. It was when, when cavemen learned to tell the difference between one of their family <laughs> being eaten by a dinosaur or tri tripping over a saber-toothed tiger. I don't know. <laughs> Basically the same thought processes, I think. And are you a fan of snooker? Because I, I, yes. I play uh, myself at snooker. Uh, yeah. in my basement and then do an audio, audio commentary right. of that, which I put out for the public to enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any psychologists in the room who <laughs> would like to analyse that sentence? Um, <laughs> did you ever, did, when you were a kid, and if you played, did you, did you have your own snooker table? Uh, yeah, we did. We had a, a, a six by three, yeah, six foot by three foot snooker table, which is the default size of 1980s snooker <laughs> yeah. tables for uh, people who had a house that wasn't big enough to have a massive great did it go on top of a table or did it have no, its own No, no, it, uh, it was its own table. It no. was very much itself, but the pockets were slightly too small. Ah. It was really hard to get the balls in, so quite often I'd play without a cue ball and just <laughs> like, build a break by knocking the ball straight into the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Fantasise about being the new Steve Davis. <laughs> Happy days. I I mean, it's, good to, it's good to allow yourself some successes of yeah. like hitting, hitting a ball directly into a pocket and pretending <laughs> it was a good shot. And that my positional play, to be fair, was outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> Very hard to snoop uh, anyone. Yeah, that's uh, right. in that. It becomes just what, do you, what do you call that game? Just there's always no snookers in, in here. Always in position for the next shot. It's <laughs> like a young Ronnie O'Sullivan, but more so. <laughs> and did you ever play your, Did you ever play yourself and commentate on the games against um, two different? I don't players? think. Uh, What's wrong with you? Actually, I don't know. Why I did you not did play myself at snooker? But yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember the commentary. Have you, have you tried doing the same with boxing? You tried fighting yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I mean, yet. I mean, that's just a standard Friday night out in some cities in England. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried running, but I can't, I, I can do it, I do like half marathons and things, yeah. but I've done it in a way that each run I do is, is alternates between the two. So I ran a half marathon a few weeks ago, but in the training, me one ran and then me two ran, and then I select, the selectors decided which, <laughs> right, which one would run the actual race. I considered changing halfway between the two, right, but I felt that would be cheating. Yeah, that's... I mean, you're only letting down the competition. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so me too ran and was excellent. The right. selectors did well. And was there a bit of resentment from me one well, I, I could have done equally as well? Or? No, as we were going round... Grudging, grudging respect. There was grudging yeah, respect. That's good. He had tried to sabotage, I think, all the way through the training right. process. <laughs> yeah. uh, and subconsciously. Well, I was at the start line... Of the, of the, I mean, it's a bit Fight Club this, but I think this might be the case because I don't, I don't remember doing this. Right. I, was, I was at the start line, and it's in the Royal Parks, and everything was cordoned off, and all the runners were behind us, and we we're at the start line doing the celebrity photo shoot, right. which I didn't know who any of the other people were. <laughs> in, I wasn't sure who I was clearly, <laughs> uh, and uh, a man so came out of nowhere on a Boris bike, cycled up behind us, and kind of hit me and the woman next to us, quite ne next to me, sorry, not us, uh, quite. <laughs> confusing quite hard and I thought maybe me one had paid a, a hitman sort of David Cameron style hitman right to take me out the a race literal hitman so that he could then take the place right of me too who was kind of too this injured. is the new Nancy Kerrigan Tom <laughs> Hardy yeah, it is. being nobbled by yourself though I think maybe I arranged you know subconsciously without me one I arranged that so that I, I, I out of spite or in the hope of taking the position right but I don't think me one realized if he broke me two's leg, it would still be hard for me one to do the race. Right. I can see this simmering resentment really. Yeah. But by the end, on. by the end, genuinely, he was yeah. there going, yeah, no, fair enough. The best man. <laughs> it, was so the, it was the correct choice. Like, like um, Tom Cruise and um, the other one in Top Gun at the end, was it? Was, was me <laughs> one saying, you could be my wingman anytime. Yeah, yeah, it was. But me one will get his chance next year. Well, it's, easy easy for the selectors to say. it's easy for the selectors to say that, but there must yeah. be doubts thinking, my time has gone as a top-level <laughs> athlete. <laughs> With all due respect. Well, uh, we'll see. You know, it is, you're right, it has to be. It has to be over. So I'll ask you an emergency question, just because, you know, the talk of me one versus me two seems to have uh, destroyed the atmosphere. <laughs> um, if you had to choose between dating a uh, man 
Uh, who was, you, there's, there's two people you can choose today, and these are the two okay. people. Right. We imagine you're not married, or that your wife has died. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to <laughs> imagine that, and you got over okay. it. You're mainly over it. I'm you're mainly back, over you're it. Back in, okay, I mean, you're right. I'm back com- in the game. You're never going to be completely over it. And right. But okay. you're mainly, you know, you can't have most of the time over it. And then you decide about. <laughs> you just brought it all back. <laughs> you had to get. Uh, you're back on the dating wheel, and you. She's had to not choose. dead, is she? No, she's <laughs> all right. right. She's all right. <laughs> man, enjoying that. Uh, if you had to choose between dating a man who was a six foot penis with a face, <laughs> so he's literally no testicles, just a penis, right. everything. He hasn't got any arms, but he has a face. So yes. some, you know, you could kiss his face and his right. mouth. That's Norman Tebbit, isn't it? <laughs> it could be. Uh, a lot of politicians do look like that when you see it. If you just take off the shoulders, there's quite a lot of no-neck <laughs> people who basically look like that. With just a little face. You might have, you know, you could have a, a wig like you, your hair on there. Right. <laughs> if that, wouldn't be too, if that wouldn't be too weird. Okay. Uh, and, or a man who is a normal man, except instead of a penis, he has a tiny man. <laughs> who is... Right. Uh, the balls are still there, but the man is his feet are down, so he's right. like that, and he's facing to. W- Someone asked on Twitter which way is, okay. which way is the man facing, which right. has not been addressed. The man is facing the the little tiny man is facing the, the man. Right. So if you looked at, it, so I think if it was that way around, it would just be too strange. Right. You'd just be you'd be looking at your own penis right. and the bum of the. Right. You just your eyes would be drawn to the bum of the man. Right. But he's that way around, so you can, if you, if you, if you imagine it was your own penis, okay. you could look at his face and go, hello, and you go, hello, how you doing? I'm not saying my penis is that wide, that's just, right. you know, I'm just using that as a... Uh, okay, I'm sorry, so the ultimate philosophical quandary. <laughs> I believe, <laughs> believe sure. Soren Kierkegaard wrote it about, about it at length. Yeah. Um, Which do you, would you well, prefer? I think, and do you have any subsidiary questions? In terms of dating, I'd definitely go for the man with the, uh, the human penis. Yeah. Um, rather than the human penis man. Okay. Um, <laughs> Because you know it's dating, isn't it? You know yeah. we don't know if it's going to even reach the sexual <laughs> level. So you know, just you know, just go and have a nice meal. Then you're just having a nice meal. And you can probably ignore the fact that the man. You probably wouldn't even. Know, how would I know? I mean, as he said on his dating profile, <laughs> my penis is a small man. <laughs> In you which might case, give me a giveaway when you're just every now and again there's a tiny was going, let me out, right. give me some. I want something to eat. Well, that's something to talk Let's about, isn't go. it? <laughs> I mean, he'd, he'd probably console me about my ongoing <laughs> grief about my, my late wife. <laughs> Why are you but, I mean, or, but then, you know, if, is this an online dating thing or not? Well, I d- because I if someone has put on a profile picture <laughs> who is a six-foot penis yeah. that doesn't look anything like a six-foot penis, then I think you have... You probably have some kind of legal right of complaint, don't you? I think you could make yourself... Because well, I think... It was, I got this because the uh, Mark Reckless and the other guy, the other con- the Tory guys, both, to me, look quite like... Um, a six-foot penis. Brooks right. When you looked at their... F- they were kind of both sort of balding, so you could imagine, and then just their fate, their heads went down into their bodies. And if you took off... Th- if, you, if they just yep. took off their suit and it was revealed those shoulders were just a false shoulders, and then it just yep. went straight down... So those men, you know, you could put a picture of uh, Brooks Newmark's face yep. on a dating profile. I mean, it would put you off going on a date with him because it's his horrible face. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, And I think he'd be suspicious about going uh, on a dating website now after all that happened. He's the yes. guy um, who, you know, the girl pretended, the journalist pretended yeah. to be a girl. Well, I think if you did hook up with someone on a dating website yeah. who did turn out to be a six-foot penis, yeah. then... Probably you'd realise that the reason they were dating was just for some company rather than... Yeah. I don't think they'd actually be looking for a sexual relationship. So I think, in many ways, that would be fine as well. <laughs> you've got to be open-minded about these things, particularly when, you, when you've been unexpectedly widowed. <laughs> I'm not saying you couldn't do better than a six-foot penis. Right. I'm not saying that that's... If you're single again, that's all you're going to... Th- those are your only two options. Right. You might have three or four, you know, you might have someone... Right, who's got two arms that are penises <laughs> yeah. two legs that are massive nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not rule that out, Richard. Who knows? No, I should write that we're, down. We're not, <laughs> life throws us many curveballs. <laughs> and um, if you were dying, uh, which celebrity would you like to stroke your head and face <laughs> as you died? Right. Is there a celebrity you would... Oh, wow. Uh, I think David Attenborough. Yeah, he'd be nice. Yeah, I mean, I think... 
Um, this, well, well, no. well, that'd be nice. Well, I mean, he's seen a lot of... I mean, he's basically made an entire career out of zebra snuff movies and insect porn. <laughs> right? he, death would hold no fears for Attenborough. He's basically immortal as well, isn't he? I mean, he's looked 90 for the last 40 <laughs> years. He's, doing he's the well. nation's unofficial granddad. He is. It would be nice. It would be. That would be very comforting. That would be very nice. Yeah. I think I went for Bouncer from Neighbours. <laughs> I don't know why. No. <laughs> would he not lick your face? <laughs> well, possibly right. hump your dying leg. <laughs> <laughs> Something. You know, this, the last moments on earth. I often think Did about that. Did he do that to Jim Robinson when he had his heart attack? Behind <laughs> yeah. the sofa. He died. <laughs> Who would have thought? I know. If, if, if anyone out of Jim Robinson or Bouncer would go on to have a massive Hollywood career, I would have gone for Bouncer. <laughs> You'd, who'd have believed Jim Robinson would have, with all the stuff he went on to? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Uh, so you're on tour at the moment, up yes. against uh, 109 other comedians on tour. One yeah, of them I'm is, easily one of them the best, best of them. Yeah. Um, and it's a satirist for hire. Yes. And you, you, are you making up a show, every, a new show every night? Well, not entirely, but people are emailing me in the issues they want me to address at the show they're coming to. So I've had to satirise to order issues ranging from the situation with ISIS in the Middle East and you know, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of ISIS at all I find them at best aggressive conversationalists <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously I had a lot of Scottish referendum stuff during the Edinburgh Fringe um, uh, stuff about the state of British <coughs> democracy from that going to people emailing and saying please could you satirise all 719 Pokemon characters individually? <laughs> um, or it's my mate's birthday, can you take the piss out of him? <laughs> so it's a, it's a full range, the full, yeah. the full gamut. And do you, do you think, uh, you mentioned that you touched on the, the, the state of the, the democracy we're in at the moment, and, R and Russell Brand is uh, putting himself up as a yeah. sort of Jesus. Jesus figure. Yeah, he's sort of a cross between Jesus and Lloyd George, I think. <laughs> <laughs> do you uh, fancy throwing your hat into the ring against... If I, do you, I sort of wonder whether, whether a kind of parliament of comedians might be the, might be the solution. Just, um, for, just for one sitting. One si yeah, one for one year. year we, can oh, we come what, for one five-year sitting, or yeah, just yeah. one day? Well, I think probably we could get it done in a year. I think comedians would be good, because it would be, yeah. A, it would be a lot funnier. Yeah. Well, the slightly. jokes would be better. Uh, marginally. But I think also there's, you know, there's three or four things that just need to be done and then we could give it, give it back. Um, I think, you'd, A, uh, proportional representation. Comedians would bring that in. <laughs> I think we'd knock what, down... Why? Uh, just because it makes more sense to do that in right. the current... But will they bring it in in a funny way? Would there be some, like, comic twist? No, I think, I think you would find the comedians would just... They would mess around for a bit and they would... Uh, you know, be Russell Brandon and use the opportunity to self-promote their books for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then they go, hey, should we just get this sorted out? And I think we do it quite quickly. I think most comedians are quite sensible, you know, down to it, most of them, right. uh, underneath. So they're not about, for, you know, I think make a, build a new parliament. Yeah. That's needs doing. The, yeah, wireless. The, Got to the, make it wireless this time. Yeah. <laughs> Too well, many wires in the current parliament. I do what would be good, just having a, a parliament that has enough room for everyone to sit down. <laughs> yeah. I think that would be a good thing to do. Well, so I'd knock down, I'd yeah. blow up the Houses of Parliament on November the 5th. <laughs> Just for old times. Yeah, so. yeah. People would pay to see that. And you probably raise, en raise enough money from that to pay off the national debt and everything. What do you think you'd sell the TV rights for for that? <laughs> for <laughs> well, this is another one of your terrorist atrocities. <laughs> it would be good. Well, if you made enough money, I think, you know, you, worldwide, you know, and the American market would pay a lot for that, wouldn't they? If, especially if people dressed up as... Uh, Ian Gunpowder, as I call him, Guy Fawkes. <laughs> um, he, um, if, they, if, they, if they played the whole thing out and then it was all blown up with people yeah. in period costume, maybe the all cast right. of Downton Abbey sitting in the all House right. of Lords as it goes up. But uh, that's basically already happening, isn't it? The <laughs> House of Lords? Yes. Um, yeah, but, no, there's definitely something to be said for uh, <laughs> blowing up Parliament for, yeah. for money. Yeah. And then building a new Parliament yeah. that's you know, modern and just... Where would you build it? Um, London or what do you want? Strasbourg. It Strasbourg. <laughs> <laughs> Just to piss off Nigel Farage, make him his commute easier. Well, maybe we, we could, rather than blowing up the current parliament, just sell it to the EU and they can move from Strasbourg. To <laughs> that could work. That could work. Well, I don't know. I think. It, what do you think of Russell Brand? Do you, are, you, are you enjoying his foray into politics? I am. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, you know, he's a. Uh, he's. Um, He's been very entertaining. <laughs> um, he, he once did my, I did a, a 
done it, a gig that you've done many times, Political Animal, where I host it and have different acts on doing political sets. And he did it uh, sort of just when he was starting to get famous at the Soho Theatre, and they'd forgotten to list it. So there were about 15 people in the audience, and the first two acts basically walked off and said, I'm, I can't be asked with this. And Russell Brand, who was supposed to be doing 15 minutes, uh, did barefoot 45 minutes to an audience of 15 people. So I've been, I've always sort of respected him since then because the, the other two acts weren't by no means as famous as him. Neither of them could be asked to entertain my 15 strong crowd, <laughs> which is the only time I've done a gig that hasn't been totally sold out <laughs> in my entire <laughs> career. Um, so uh, I think it's, you know, it's interesting to have a different, <laughs> a different uh, perspective. I'm not sure, I mean, he's clearly not costed everything out, but then, <laughs> you know, then neither had Jesus Christ. And the, you, know, you know, the meek inheriting the earth. What are the finances on that? Uh, Robin, Robin Hood, the founder of progressive taxation, but, you know, the, he hadn't thought of the long-term economic consequences of, of you know, the, all, the, all the rich emigrating to the Cayman Islands from Nottingham. <laughs> The problem Robin Hood as well was he stole from the rich and gave to the poor, which then just made the poor the rich, so he then had to steal from them to give back to the rich. He should have just worked out how much everyone had and then skimmed off a bit and then given well, that. It's property tax, I think. <laughs> and then worked it out so it was all equal. Then he wouldn't probably have But he had went tight green leggings, didn't he, and got away with it. <laughs> That's all the HMRC needs to make people more enthusiastic about paying tax. Tight green leggings. It worked for Errol Flynn. It will work for them. And do you think UKIP are going to become uh, the next government or be involved in the next government? Uh, I, well, in layman's terms, I fucking hope not. Um, <laughs> it's amazing how quickly they've made a transition from lunatic fringe party to lunatic mainstream party. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I, li I like the idea of Europe. I think, um, you know, I've, I'm 40 now. I've really enjoyed not being slaughtered to pieces in a massive pan-continental conflict. <laughs> so it's been awesome. So it would be a shame if Europe really fucks things up to the extent that UKIP um, take over, yeah. take over the Queen or whatever their ultimate goal is. It's quite, it's, but it's sort of weird. It well, is she weird. She dresses in purple sometimes, doesn't she? It does show, I think, UKIP that um, there, you know, that there. People say, oh, there's no point in voting. There's no point in doing anything. But it, it's, it's quite a minority interest party, and they've managed to put their interest right at the centre of government. So Russell Brand telling all young people not to vote because it's a waste of time. If all young people came together and voted for, you know, young people kip, uh, yeah. which they do, don't they? So <laughs> it's then, you know, then th that would become... Because the problem is, like, that old people vote, so yeah. democracy favours old people. Yeah, well, this, this... See, I think you should be given ten votes that you can use at any point in your life <laughs> from the age of five upwards. And that, so you'd have to manage your democratic output. <laughs> yeah. Because it just favours the old for, you know, not dying. They can just binge vote in there once they've got can't they? Well, I, I'm, I'm quite in favour of electoral fraud as well, because <laughs> I'd, I'd go the opposite way from Russell Brand. I would encourage young people to vote as much as possible, <laughs> even to the point of illegality. Right. Because you can't complain about apathy and about electoral fraud. It's just <laughs> commitment and enthusiasm <laughs> for the process for me. It's quite easy yeah. to do. It's quite easy to do electoral fraud. Have you ever? I imagine that happened. But uh, you, when you go to the thing, they just uh, you give them, you tell them your name and address. Yeah. I mean, you could just look at the list and see who hasn't been ticked off and give that name and address, and chances are they're not going to turn up anyway. No. The good two to one. You know, you get four or five in. Just go. Yeah. To I mean, the technology is just a pencil and a ruler, isn't it? Yeah. Crossing out people's <laughs> names. It is. Yeah. I don't. That is not foolproof. Is it? <laughs> it isn't. So as long as you know the name of person, I think once I got uh, about six uh, polling cards put through my door for loads of people in my street. So I could have just gone back right. a few times in funny moustaches. <laughs> <laughs> or dresses. You're not averse to a funny moustache, <laughs> are you? I'm not. I'm not. Oh. It's, it has been uh, it's something I've done before, yeah. No, I like Europe. So I'm no, really not allowed to say it. I want to be part of Europe, and it's much better. Yeah, there's me and that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start the fuck off UK part. Let's destroy <laughs> the UK. I mean, I kind of would like to destroy all countries. Yeah. I mean, not like literally, just not, not like just wipe them out, just have no countries. Right. So we'll make, the, we'll make the World Cup really boring. <laughs> kind of thing like Think of the sports fan, Richard. Yeah. With you. All right. You make one world weird. utopia. Um, <laughs> I think I'm done on that. There okay. was something else, but it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favourite thing a terrorist has ever done? I know it's been terrorism heavy, but my favourite thing is you. 
you were lucky this time, I only have to be lucky once, which is a great line. Yeah. Do you have a, you know, I know they've done a lot of bad things, terrorists, but is there a thing... Justify. Um. <laughs> is there anything that you admire terrorists, terrorists for? I mean, um. Nelson Mandela for, is uh, technically a, a terrorist, so you could choose him. Yep. Uh, he did a lot of good stuff on Jesus balance. is a terrorist. Jesus? <laughs> yeah, technically. Was he? Well, if you believe uh, uh, the uh, Jesus, uh, the Zealot book by... Um, oh, I've forgotten his name. Is that Des great? Lynham? Was it? Isn't it? <laughs> is that great guy who was on... Is the guy who was on uh, Fox News or something with the, and then, uh, the Muslim guy? Is it, and then the Fox News are having going, going how, can a Muslim, how can a Muslim write about Jesus? That's, that's not fair. Christians should be writing about Jesus because they will be balanced uh, about it. Uh, it's, oh, no, I've, got, I've forgotten his name. I apologise to him. You should buy his book, Jesus the Zealot. But that, that, the argument right. is he was a kind of revolutionary and... Uh, Terrorist. Yeah, well, it was trying to th overthrow the Romans. That's what it was right. about. Yeah, I mean, I like the Romans. There's yeah. a lot of good stuff. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, for me, and also I'm Jewish, so I think you know, Jesus was quite literally banged to rights. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, it was Messianic in charge of a donkey, I think, they got involved in the end. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like the Al Capone of his day. But, um, uh, oh, favourite thing a terrorist ever done? Uh, Oh, I don't know. Uh, that is genuinely something I've never thought of. I've never. <laughs> <laughs> I have not spent a lot of time. I'm just trying to say, you know, they're mainly bad, but they're not necessarily uh, all bad. There was um, that tie break at Wimbledon in 1980, which I believe was Bjorn Borg's covert way of uh, calling in some kind of <laughs> terrorist atrocity in in, uh, in Mongolia, I believe. <laughs> but I don't know. It depends which way. If you if you play it backwards, yeah, the Ball on his racket in Morse code. <laughs> Spells attack Ulan Bator now. <laughs> Does that count? Yes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, are you ever mistaken for Andy Kaufman, the, uh, um, the surrealist American? No, I can genuinely say that's never no. ever happened. No. I, I don't know if he was ever mistaken for me. No. Or if, because well, there's some people think he's still alive. They do. Maybe I am him. But well, I'm not going to say that on this podcast. <laughs> that would be great if I'm you I'm going to wait until I've got a book out. Okay. And I'm do it <laughs> Tragedy plus time equals book deal. That's the <laughs> it does. And do you, how do you think podcasts are, are doing in the, the, the grand scheme of things? How's yours Pod been going for you? Uh, it's, it's been You've been doing yours for seven years. Seven years. We just had our seventh birthday. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's incredible. The, when we talked about it last week, the, the, the technology is... Because seven years ago... We were basically just on yogurt pots on either side of the Atlantic <laughs> with, a, with a taut string, and people just had to like listen in through a wall with a glass on the wall. But now <laughs> it's just all done on the internet. Um, so, <laughs> so it's amazing the uh, the technology. It's uh, yeah, it's, I mean it's clearly it's the biggest grossing medium uh, in <laughs> the history of the creative arts. So um, it's it's all about the dollar now. It's all about the dollar. You always done, but you were always on separate continents with the Bugle. Didn't start with you. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So he'd gone. John had gone to do the Daily Show about a year and a bit before we started the Bugle. Yeah. So we've done. A, we've done a few episodes on the same continent, but I don't know if any, anyone's done a kind of scientific study over whether those are funnier or less funny than when <laughs> there is. And a can you see each other when Atlantic. you're doing it? Are you on Skype? No. Or you know, just is an no, audio. No. Uh, just, uh, just, just audio, so we can. Imagine. I mean, there was one where John began, he was recording in a hotel room and began the episode by announcing that he was completely and utterly <laughs> clothesless, <laughs> which I found when well, that was more distracting than I should have found it, I think. Yeah. Because, I mean, I don't know. If, I think it would have been easier to have been able to Skype him to. I think that it was the thought of the nudity that was more distracting than the actual fact of it. <laughs> but anyway, well, that's often the way, isn't it? Does it make does it make the timing of the conversations difficult to be? Well, when John is n naked. Well, or that as well. <laughs> just the solid thud of <laughs> wang on leg. <laughs> <laughs> Surely seven years ago there was there was you know there was a time delay between the conversations as well. Yeah, well, most, yes. Well, the pigeons have got faster. <laughs> um, no, it's I mean it's pretty fast on the uh, ISDN line. But yeah. uh, when we do it, uh, occasional episodes by phone, there is a bit of a bit of a lag, but you know, yeah. hopefully the joke still works. As long as it's got a more than a 5% hit rate, that's fine, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we've, I think we've done that today. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Just about. Just about. Yeah. <laughs> Worth a that, Bruce Forsyth. That one has brought it down to 4%. <laughs> <laughs> that particular joke. Uh, but uh, I was going... Oh, yeah, so and, and you, are you, uh, how are you funding that now? Because it was, used to be with The Times. Yes. And then we were funded by Evil Murdoch money for four yeah. years. And now we're funded by Listener voluntary subscriptions, which <laughs> turns out doesn't raise as much money as compulsory <laughs> subscriptions. <laughs> Who would have thought that? <laughs> um, but it's sort of kept us ticking over for yeah. another three years. So. Does John not feel he could use some of his uh, a daily show <laughs> millions? Know, yeah. When he feeds his dog solid gold every day. I ask people to give money. You, know, you can always ask. <laughs> Can buy a, they can get I can buy bugle socks now as well. Oh, can you? Uh, the, the, the sock is the... That's, there will always be a demand for socks. Pe- yeah. As long as people have feet, there will be, there will be socks. Do you have any testicle-shaped ones for the people whose feet, feet, feet are, are testicles? testicles. Legs not, are testicles. not as of yet, no. Richard, but thanks for well, you know, it's alerting me to that gap in the <laughs> commercial market. <laughs> I'll, ask a, uh, I'll ask an emergency question. I feel we need it. They're, you know, the emergency questions often aren't required, but they are to, de- <laughs> to just the, the sl- a slight tension from the audience. It's right. going quite well, isn't it? I could, do an, I could do an impression, if that yeah, would okay, help. That will okay, that um, I'll do my impression of Marvin Gaye. <coughs> Hello, Dad. You look cross. <laughs> um... <laughs> And that bloke in older shot said we didn't have any That's jokes. That's right, yeah. No <laughs> jokes. No jokes. Man, how could he do that? Uh, have you ever tried to suck your own cock? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> very, very. Most people at least consider the. It makes me think you try to do it all the time. The, the <laughs> way you came back. You are, a, you are a father. I'm going to be a father. So, do you have any advice for me uh, as how to keep um, a child alive? Oh, to keep a child alive. <laughs> Uh, feed it once a week minimum. Right. <laughs> uh, generally, try to hold it upright rather than by its feet. Right. Um, uh, and uh, uh, other than that, uh, no, 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 just they're much more resilient than the newspapers would have you believe. <laughs> uh, so, um, I've managed to keep two babies alive. I'm two yeah. for two in keeping. That's like those guys spinning plates as well. Yeah, yeah. It's like Please. there's one going, then you yeah. have to rush off and do the other one. And I am one of the most naturally incompetent people <laughs> I've ever <laughs> ever met. So um, if I can keep my children alive, I, yeah. I, ho- I have a lot of hope for you, Richard. Good. Uh, but also, I think one of the great joys of parenthood is to be confronted by your own failures on an almost daily <laughs> basis. So be prepared for that. Yeah. I can do that on my own. I don't need a yeah. tiny human being <laughs> to make me realise that. Um, uh, okay, I'll ask you if. You, well, if you, well, first of all, have you ever seen a ghost? I've got to ask that. Have I ever seen a ghost? Ghost, yeah. Not a goat. Uh, a ghost. A ghost. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, no. Might start, might, I might start asking you if you ever seen a ghost. I've not seen one. <laughs> uh, I ate one though. Uh, you I, ate a ghost. Yeah, I went to the Fat Duck, and uh, they had a, uh, one of the courses was salmon with ghost. Was, I mean, only Blumenthal could carry that off, I reckon. That was an extraordinary recipe. Have you ever seen a Bigfoot? A Bigfoot? Yeah. Um, no, no. I mean, I did use. I grew up in Tunbridge Wells. And there was, <laughs> during the mid '80s, there was a brief infestation on the common of, of, of um, you know Yeti-like creatures, but um, no, I don't believe. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was during term time, so I didn't really get out to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Turned out they just late, later escaped Tories from the local conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a goat? A goat? Yeah, in real life. No, I've seen them in museums. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's the best place to see a goat, I believe. Yeah. Not, it's not gone as well, that new emergency question, as I was, <laughs> as I was hoping. I'm not even going to write that down. Uh, for the, for that, the did sa- that sounded like a kind of curious line of questioning in some <laughs> cop drama, <laughs> kind of legal drama. That, yeah, you know, suddenly you're asking me, have I ever seen a goat was going to lead me to confessing my yeah. complicity in the Kennedy hit or something. <laughs> Often these questions, because people have never been asked that before, and so they're not prepared, yeah. and then it can. The Bigfoot one so far has not led to anything. <laughs> but when I meet, when I have a guest who has seen a Bigfoot, but you know, submerged that memory, right. imagine how fucking great it's going to be. Gonna be awesome. go, 
Oh yeah. yeah. I did I did see a Bigfoot that time and I never thought During about those five years in the Himalayas and I was fleeing justice and then you're gonna <laughs> get to the, the bottom of their hideous crime spree. And uh, if you could travel through time, the whole of you. What do you mean if? If and when. <laughs> oh. You'd be a very good Doctor Who. Thanks. You've got that the hair that's probably twenty five percent of the path. <laughs> <laughs> you actually look like, even you look quite like a composite of all the Doctor Who's. Right. <laughs> There have ever been. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I think, the look my parents were going for. When they designed me. Certainly, you know, the old, the pre new wave Doctor. The, yeah. the, pre, the new Doctor Who's have slightly thrown. Well, you used to be able to um, um, get a sort of fertility kit in which you would get a vial of the seed of all the actors who'd ever played Doctor <laughs> Who. And so you would Mix get it up. <coughs> And you know you could end up with something <laughs> like this. And when you say that, it presumably they've been genetically spliced together to create one semen. No, you just have to shake it really hard. <laughs> 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 they would all coalesce. Yeah. And then you would be all of the Doctor yeah. Who's. That's why. Yeah. If you ever meet a baby who was conceived during an earthquake, <laughs> then they, look, they look like a mixture of all kinds of. Anyway, it doesn't. <laughs> that didn't make any logical sense, but it didn't because that sort of implies. The, the sperm of different men would <laughs> somehow got mixed together. If your yeah. baby was born du conceived during an earthquake, it would just be one gigantic sperm from the same guy. <laughs> There'd be a super DNA of, of that person. If you could travel through time, where would you go to if you could travel through time? I've just made it more... That's a more... Right. Isn't it? That's a, rather than fingers and cocks and stuff. <laughs> that's a proper question right. that people can answer. Well, it depends where... I mean, if you go back to ancient Greece, then you're basically just getting fingers and cocks. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> so, and a little bit of philosophy chucked in, <laughs> and the odd tunic. Uh, I think I probably would go. I'd go to ancient Athens, I would think, you? and uh, try and introduce cricket <laughs> in <laughs> sort of 420 BC, because I think that would have completed their civilization. That was all that was missing. But I mean, if you ignore the rampant institutionalized misogyny, <laughs> but but apart from that, they were on the right track with a lot of things, and I think cricket would have. That would have, they would have never, have, they wouldn't have lost it then. They'd, they'd still be, Greece would be a very different country today if they'd chosen cricket instead of naked wrestling. <laughs> it's all, all gone downhill since then. And how many hours a day do you spend in your shed? Oh, which I'm fascinated by your shed. I've yes. I've talked to you about it backstage. Right. You have a shed in your garden. I have a shed in my garden. That you work in. I, w I work in. I That's what I really want more than anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's good to have a dream. It's good to aim. <laughs> I'm does not, it not for the skies, but for the shed. Does it double up as oh, a... Also the initial version of the S Club 7 song. <laughs> Reach for the shed. <laughs> does it double up as a potting shed, or is it just a work shed? Is it like, have you got tools in there? Or no, I have no tools in my shed. No. Just the tools of setups and punchlines. Um, cricket, you do cricket commentaries in your shed? Um, oh, I look up cricket statistics in okay. my shed quite extensively yeah. to the point where I've become psychologically unhinged and need <laughs> to see an actual human being instead of a number. But um, So uh, how, how much time do you spend it? Because like, if you have children as well, that's a way of escaping your children, right? Yeah. yeah. A child, clever. A, the the child-free shed. <laughs> that, that as, a, as an impending father. Yeah, you should definitely invest in a child-free <laughs> shed. Uh, I don't well, know, it, it, it's up to 10 hours a day. Wow. Of shed time. Well, I mean, do you have? Are you self-contained? That's why we, we there? fought wars for my right to sit in a shed for yeah. ten hours. Three world wars: two hot, one cold. <laughs> if there was a nuclear war, yeah. would how long could you and the shed survive? Yeah, how, I would how, not leave. How long could you survive oh, in there for? Have you I got don't provisions? know, but I, I couldn't leave the shed alone in, in the event of a nuclear holocaust. I'd be too worried about it. I'd say I'd send my family off to the hills. Yeah, and I'd stay and look after the shed. Yeah. And, and I try and have lemons. Do lemons do away with nuclear fallout, I've heard. <laughs> Squeeze a bit of lemon everywhere. I'll give it a go. Give it a go. Bear it, I'll bear that in mind. Well, I mean, happens. look, I mean, what, uh, the uh, Italians use a lot of lemons in cooking, and there's never been a nuclear strike on Italy. <laughs> <laughs> that cannot be coincidence, can it? And have you committed any crimes recently? <laughs> um... Well, I, I stole some, uh, I steal, every time I go into a, 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 what are they called, where you drive around service stations. Right. Uh, 
Yeah, it's all right. Just, it's been going for an hour. It's hard to think of words. <laughs> I steal a pick and mix, one pick and mix from every time I go in. Right. That is technically and actually a crime. <laughs> right. I'm stealing, and I've, you know, and I've accrued over the course of a tour thousands of pounds worth of sweets. Right. Because they're quite expensive. They I think are. they're overly expensive, and that's why I steal them as a, right. as a, you, an art. Including those, those foamy bananas. Uh, I, I usually take the same thing, which is it's like a cola bottle, but it's not. It's, it's sort of like tastes like chewing gum. It's sort of slightly fruity, but it's the, but the foam. The foam bananas are they're like geese. Uh, sorry, they're like swans. They're technically owned by the queen. So <laughs> if you steal a foamy banana, that is treason. You could be executed. Be executed. For that. For that. <laughs> Rightly so. They are quite nice, but you can you can really only eat one of those as an adult, and then they're a bit too sweet. Right. Well, I the like queen that. can eat four hundred in a sitting. <laughs> And when she does that, she looks you absolutely straight in the eye. And at the end, she just says, capiche, and walks off. <laughs> you absolutely know who is in charge of this country. So have you done it? Because that's a crime. I've committed a crime there, um, and I've confessed it. Do you have any crimes you would like to confess? Now? Uh, oof, no, I, um, well, I, I hijacked um, <laughs> HMS Belfast <laughs> and jo joyrode it. Down the Thames, yeah. around the British Isles, <laughs> and back by the following morning. <laughs> at absolutely incredible speed. <laughs> um, other than that, uh, <laughs> it's hard to think of any that spring to mind. Okay, it's but, good um, to know you're law-abiding, unlike me, because it's you know that's, yeah. that's no way to behave. That drives the pick and mix prices up for everyone else. My yeah. behaviour. <laughs> They're really I assassinated high Jane Austen, <laughs> right? But that was in a previous life, so I think I'm in the clear. <laughs> Old um, gun to the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, yep. how sensitive are your nipples? <laughs> Where ten is very ten is very sensitive. Very sensitive. So that what are we talking? Are we talking emotionally sensitive? I mean, how, no, how do they deal with abuse? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about physically sen sensitive. So if someone touches them, does that have any sensation, or are they just useless male nubbins. Well, I mean, how do I, how do I scale this? I mean, this is comparative, isn't it? I mean, what do I... Well, I think you scale it by how you imagine the... Because I mind it when right. it was... Uh, they've only, they were sensitive the other week because I've been running and I hadn't put any um, right. stuff on them. You've got to put... You've got right. to gel them up. Yeah. Uh, and so they became painful. Right. But it was still better than the usual state, which is no, nothing. No. Just dead. They're just dead nubbins. Right. But, you know, when sometimes if you touch a lady's nipple... She quite, seems right. to quite like it. Right. In the so immortal <laughs> words of David Frost to Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, imagine that 10 is when a woman's going, ooh, right. ooh, what's, what's all that about? <laughs> that's, the, that's as good as it gets. Well, Who are sound, you and why are you in my bedroom? Yeah. Yeah. That sounded like it was happening on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> and zero is this, look. All right, I don't know, I'd, pi, I think. Around about three pi. Point, three point, <laughs> point. <laughs> Do you, do you envy... They're women? perfectly circular as well. Which <laughs> is the great irony of that. <laughs> and we have nearly, we're nearly uh, finished. <laughs> but I'm going to keep pushing it on. <laughs> till we get somewhere. Um, that's quite a good question. I haven't seen this one before. What is the worst place you have been sick? <laughs> that's a good emergency question. It's a good emergency question that I don't think I've ever called upon before. The, wor uh, the worst place. I mean, I don't know if that means like location or into. <laughs> Could be like the worst town or the worst uh, receptacle. I was uh, sick in Locks Bottom once. <laughs> you? <Yeah. laughs> Just a fair. Um, yep. That's, I mean, that's, there's not a lot to write home about from Locks Bottom other than... Dear Mum, please send new shirt. I've been sick all over it. Um, yeah, oh, that's uh, and uh, the Queen's bedroom. Well, yeah. But, yeah, Do you know when Michael Fagan broke into um, <laughs> the Queen's bedroom? Yeah, I've forgotten what I th what I think happened now. So he did. So did he put his he, did he put his cock in her ear? Is that why? <laughs> is that why? He, that's a story I heard. I think so you you're mixing up with Francois Mitterrand, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> the wily old sea dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is the question I wanted to ask you. Um, well, that's quite a good one as well. Uh, uh, did, when you were a kid or as an adult, have you ha what was? Do you, do you ever have any mundane encounters with celebrities? When you were a child, did you meet any? I met Don Estelle and Ted Rogers. 
when I was a kid. Uh, and was rude to the, both of them. Um, what? Jeff Capes came to my <laughs> to, to my school prize giving. Jeff Capes, the strong man, strong man, uh, legendary people. strong man, former. Could uh, he pull a bus athlete. with his mouth? Um, I think he could pull anything. He, yeah. was, a, he was a buff guy. He was. His housewives <laughs> loved him. Um, uh, and he came to give out the prizes at my school. Yeah. Well, it was a bit odd to be given a prize for you know academic excellence <laughs> by a man. Who had devoted his entire life to being able to pull a lor- pull a truck with his mouth? That, I mean, <laughs> that was sending out very mixed messages for me. But it was pretty mundane. He just kind of, yeah, shook his hand and he. Mm-hmm. Was he was, was he as big in real life as he looked like on TV? Uh, no, but uh, he was uh, he's about four foot eight, but he stands behind a prison. <laughs> <laughs> Giant prison. And that's the secret of his uh, of his success. What happened to Brian Jacks? What happened to Brian Jacks? Yeah. <laughs> what happened to Brian Jacks? You were interested in sport. Uh, do you remember Brian Jacks? Yeah, he was uh, the, the <laughs> legend of the TV series Superstars. He was. Uh, which I think they, they dug up from the TV grave recently. Superstars. Oh, they? It wasn't quite as good, but they used to have like, top-level sportsmen. Kevin Keegan fell off his bike, didn't he? Keegan, and they, were re- they would really go for each other. In, in, yeah. in, in a Brian totally Jacks could do... He was, a judo, he was a judo player. Yeah. He, he was the absolute... He was the Nebuchadnezzar of the squat thrust, as far as... Does anyone know what happened to Brian Jacks? Is he still going? He runs a judo school in Beckenham. He runs a judo school in Beckenham. (laughs) That was said with some authority, but not total authority. (laughs) Usually, this audience is like a Wikipedia, so you can ask them anything. Right. More recently, I've noticed they're getting more stupid, but that is very, very impressive, unless he's just looked it up on Wikipedia. (laughs) Which we should be deploying him to, to Syria to fight against ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he could well, be that anyone. man or Brian Jack. Both in town. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he could be the hype man and Jacks could do the fighting. <laughs> I once got into trouble with superstars because I can't remember who it was, some Yorkshire uh, athlete or rugby player maybe, and he, he nearly won the whole of superstars. Was it Andy Ripley? And no, I don't no. think. I, don't, can't, I honestly can't remember his name. Uh, but he he just lost in the marathon or whatever they're doing, the heart line they won't be doing a marathon but a long race and he lost by a few seconds so he didn't become the superstar European superstars or whatever and then he said it's a damn bloody shame and then I said that to my dad later and he hit me <laughs> really yeah <laughs> for, for swearing right he well, might have a val- valuable lesson though isn't it yeah well, I was just copying don't, the man off superstars don't quote <laughs> don't quote losers <laughs> <laughs> It's a damn bloody shame. <laughs> cool. It is a damn bloody shame that we have to now end. Oh, this that, that was beautifully <laughs> done. You. That was uh, that was like seeing a, a champion dressage artist. It'd be better if jumping I from a horse onto a motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> if my dad now came in and hit me across the face, <laughs> that would be the perfect end. <laughs> Which he would still do. Yeah. Does not like swearing, and rightly right. so. No. Do not swear. That's what I'll be teaching my child. Do not swear. It's fucking. <laughs> <laughs> when, my, when my daughter was about, I think she was about one and a half, and she was just starting to really get into talking as a hobby. And um, <laughs> we just overheard her sit, sitting in her bedroom uh, saying, Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. Fuck. <laughs> a uh, little bit of uh, parroting going on there. <laughs> it took a little while, but she got there in the end. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Zalsman. Thank you. We'll be back after these short messages. Thank you very much. Do you like them sky potatoes? (laughs) Hey, hope you enjoyed my podcast. If you did, you can make contributions lots of different ways. Why not go to gofasterstrike.com and buy a DVD? Gofasterstrike.com slash badges, buy a badge. 
ideally get a monthly subscription of a pound and that will help us to make other stuff and you get lots of benefits as well or come and see me on tour at richtain.com slash gigs thanks for watching and or listening see you next time bye <laughs>